Detroit Rock City, yes. Hi, it's great to be here with you today. My name is Thaddeus McCotter. I'm currently the servant of Michigan's 11th Congressional District Sovereign Citizens. I'm also, by profession, a simple country lawyer from Detroit. And before I take the opportunity to share with you the solutions to all the world's problems in the next 20 minutes, I would like to thank you for what you do for the Republican Party, what you do for your communities, and what you do for our country. Every single one of you is an heir of Lincoln and Reagan and has taken their mantle of the expansion of human liberty, taken time from your own lives, to make a difference in the life of our nation. And all you ask for in return is the hope of good governance. And for that, I thank you very much. How we come to be Republicans is, of course, an individual matter. I, for one, came by a very strange route. My mother was a very moderate Eisenhower Republican school teacher. My father, was a school teacher who happened to be a very adamant Reagan Democrat. Emphasis on the latter at the time. But as we grow up, we are instilled with principles and moral teachings from our parents. Now, my father did not have an easy life. His mother died when he and his brother and sister were young. The father could not take care of them. My sister was sent away, and my father and his brother, Frank, were raised in the St. Frank home for boys. And yet, throughout the entire time that I knew my father, he never complained about his lot in life. He always worked hard and never expected nor asked for a handout. And he taught us that there was an inherent dignity in work and that no one is better than you and that you are better than no one. And he also taught my brother and I a very great lesson. When I was about seven, in 1972, my brother was six, my father took us on a ride in our family station wagon. He was going to teach us a lesson about our country, a country that he loved very much. So my brother and I were sitting around playing my father walked up to us. I want you to imagine the picture of my father. He's a great athlete in his time. He's about five foot ten. He looked like a fire hydrant covered in hair <coughs> everywhere but the top of his head. And he said, get in the station wagon. We're going to see something. And so we came from our suburban home. We drove out to Ann Arbor, which is the home of the University of Michigan. Remember, this is, yeah. This is 1972. And my father drove through the streets of Ann Arbor and pointed at every hippie he saw. <laughs> and he said to my brother and I two things. The first thing he said was, if your hair ever gets that long, you will be punished severely. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. Well, as you can see, that problem has been solved. The other was that this is the greatest country on the face of the earth, and you should never feel entitled to it. You should put your heart and soul into making it better, which, by his example, he did. And now that I'm older myself, I'm no longer the child, I am the father. And the husband of my wife, Rita, first generation Mexican-American, and a registered nurse who still works weekend shifts of up to 12 hours. We have three children, George, a freshman at Grand Valley State University, Timothy going into his junior year at Catholic Central High School, and our baby girl, who's 13 going on 30, <laughs> Amelia, will be attending Mercy High School in the fall. My mother is still with us. I won't say her age but things are getting increasingly slower for her at this period of time. As people who live next door to working people, I understand what the middle class squeeze is about. 
and I, like you, like all Americans, are very concerned about the future direction of this country. We live in a period of time of great upheaval, uncertainty, angst, and chaos, both at home and abroad. As Republicans, we face this fact and we embrace the challenge before us, as other Republicans have throughout our party's history. When we think about it, in many ways, what we face parallels the challenges confronting the greatest generation. As you recall, they faced four great challenges. The first was a social, economic, and political upheaval of industrialization. The next was a world war against evil enemies. They faced the rise of the Soviet Union as a strategic threat and rival model of governance. And they faced the moral question of whether or not the Constitution of the United States applied to all citizens equally, regardless of race. Today, what do we face? Our generation of Americans faces the social, economic, and political upheavals of globalization. We face a world war against transnational terrorist enemies. We face the rise of the communist Chinese superstate as a strategic threat and rival model of governance. And we face the question of whether a nation built upon self-evident truths can survive moral relativism. And yet there is one stark difference between the generations. In general, the greatest generation faced their crises consecutively. We currently face our crises simultaneously. And just as we face these simultaneous trials, we are called upon to weave a seamless garment of triumph so that the generation we have inherited can be conserved and improved and bequeathed to our children and future generations of free people. And I have no doubt that we will. Because the solutions we will put forward are going to be based on five principles that we share and that we have received from the founding generation of this nation forward. And they are these. Our liberty is from God not the government. Our sovereignty is in our souls, not the soil or a scepter. Our security is from strength, not appeasement or surrender. Our prosperity is from the private sector, not the public sector. And our truths are self-evident, not relative. So you say, how do we apply these to the problems today? We apply them as generations before us always have, successfully. Let's address the issue of globalization. What do we see in Washington, and what do we see around the hearth of home? Well, in Washington, what we see under the Obama administration is that the era of big government is not over. It is imploding. Yeah. Yes. This is why we as Republicans, as Americans, have to stand fast for fiscal integrity within Washington. We have to continue to support a balanced budget amendment that puts the sovereign people in the room with the appropriators and tells them you can go no further. We need, we need to have true entitlement reform that is meaningful. We need to make sure that the competition and choice that is put into entitlement programs such as Medicare that allows seniors and others to control the quality and decision-making within their receipt of government assistance continues to squeeze costs out of the system instead of coming out of the backs of the recipients. We need to have Social Security reform. Social Security reform which will allow people to control much of their own money prior to reaching age 62, rather than cutting benefits, rather than raising taxes, rather than breaking faith with the generations that have paid into it. There is a way to do it, and I will be introducing it within the next two weeks.